Hello, my name is Zoro Stachnes and I'm from the University of Bonn. It is my great pleasure to be here and talk to you on semantics and geometric information for the simultaneous localization and mapping problem in the context of autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars. I would really like to thank the organizers for giving me the possibility here to speak and I hope I can entertain you for the next 25 minutes or so presenting you the work that my team and I have done of the last approximately three years in this context. And I want to start with the question today um, that is the question that most autonomous vehicles have to answer when they want to navigate through an environment. And that's basically the question, where are we? What does the environment look like? And what's going to happen around us? So these are central questions which pose a lot of state estimation challenges that we aim at addressing in trying to provide solutions and building blocks for the perception problems related to that question. So how could information like this look like? So what you see here is an illustration of an autonomous vehicle. Um, illustrated, you also see a 3D LiDAR scan that is colored. And this color information tells you something about what you see there. So the points in the 3D world tell you something about the geometry and the colors tell you something about the semantics, so what we are actually seeing. What is a car? So which point belongs to a car, to a road, to vegetation or similar. And what you also see on that side over here, which instance an object is belonging to. If we see things like cars, pedestrians, we may wonder which points that have been reflected by a car are actually the same car, that we also get the instance information out in order to perform prediction, estimate what's going on in the scene. And the talk today addresses several aspects, what we need to estimate in order to get that knowledge. So on the one hand side, we're interested in pose information. So where are we with our vehicle? We are also obviously interested with the geometric information. So what does the world around us look like from a geometric point of view? Where are obstacles? Where, is, um, where are plane surfaces? Things like this. But we are also interested in semantic information. So what it is actually that causes this return signal? Is this a car? Is this pedestrian? Is this a human? Is this the flat surface in front of me actually the road surface? Or is what I see a part of the building? So this is the semantic information that we are interested in. So we want to estimate for every point in the 3D world, which is shown here on that side of the illustration, a color value and every color value stands for a semantic class of what we are seeing. But we do not only need the semantic information in form of a so-called semantic segmentation, we also want to estimate instance information. So what objects are we seeing? Which of the pixels belong to the same object? So that we can see here those green dots over here is car number one and those blue dots over here is car number two. So these are both um, pixels or um, 3D points that cause a return um, on a car surface, but these are actually two different cars. And the ability to distinguish this is important if you, for example, want to track the motion of those cars because two cars may move differently to the environment or finally, eventually will move differently through the environment. So you want to be able to distinguish those cars from each other and get this instance information that will allow you to do tracking and afterwards also doing predictions about what's going to happen in the future so that the vehicle can adapt its plans um, based on what it predicts going to happen. So we are not tackling prediction and tracking tasks here today, but we will start from poses, geometry, semantic information and give an outlook to instance information and what is needed in order to build such a system. The first thing you need to address if you want to estimate poses and geometry is to provide a solution to this SLAM problem, SLAM or simultaneous localization and mapping. So the simultaneous localization and mapping task allows you to estimate where you are and what the world surrounding the vehicle looks like from a geometric point of view. So we are not interested in estimating semantic information at that point, but we want to estimate the geometry of the scene. What does the world look like? And we are relying here in our systems on the so-called SUMA approach, which is a technique that um, Jens Belay, who is a postdoc in my lab, has developed over the last years. And it's a LiDAR-based SLAM system designed for autonomous vehicles. It also works with other um, robots, of course, but um, some of the adaptations are tailored 
towards autonomous vehicles. So what it does, it takes a rotating 3D LiDAR scanner, such as uh, a Velodyne scanner or an Oyster scanner or a similar sensor setup like that, and turns this, turns multiple of those scans into a globally consistent model of the environment. So how does it work? What's special about this approach? Internally, the system doesn't work with point clouds. Um, it builds a surfle-based representation. So surfle is basically a surface element where we store a location of this surface element, but also normal information about how that local surface is actually oriented. And the map internally is just a set of those surfles which represents the surrounding. If you look to those surfle-based maps, they don't necessarily look very beautiful or very aesthetic from a human point of view, but they represent the environment well in order to align new scans with respect to those old scans and, for example, also to perform loop closing tasks. And therefore, internally, we use the surfle-based representation, but of course, through the correction of the poses and how things are aligned, we can, in the end, of course, render also globally aligned point clouds, for example. Internally, the scan registration works with a projective um, approach which basically takes the model and has an S initial estimate where the system is or where the vehicle is in that model and then renders a view by projecting the 3D world, the surface information, into a virtual image and then aligns this virtual image with the actual 3D range data that it gets. And this form of projective registration um, allows us to not make an explicit data association beforehand but basically th get the data station through the projection and then optimize the viewpoint and align those scans. That's a technique that has also been successfully used before, for example, for RGBD registration in indoor environments. And we use this before uh, 3D LiDAR scanners in the outside world. We also need to perform loop closures and kind of the standard approach basically also has an initial estimate that comes from the state estimation problem and then tries to um, uh, find locations where the projected image looks similar to the actual range image that the system gets and then tries to find loop closures basically based on scan registration and then you have the typical approaches in that you need to feel, see a few scans um, over time that are consistent with each other in order to accept the loop closer. Once you have a loop closer you may be interested in doing some graph based optimization system which runs in the background. We use a post graph based system that allows us to correct the map and then builds up a globally consistent model. And that's the work um, which again called SUMA which has been released at RSS um, or published at RSS 2018 and is now kind of our standard toolbox. So this is an example how that looks like. You see here a vehicle moving through the environment. The color information here doesn't tell us anything about semantics. It's just an illustration where um, the color tells us basically the height over the ground um, of that 3D point. And you can see here, this is a scene rendered from the Kitty dataset, how the vehicle drives through the environment. And what, what is displayed here is not the surface information, it's just the registered or corrected point cloud information. So you're not seeing the inter internal surface, surface representation. We'll see that later on in some of the videos. Um, but you can see here how the map is consistently built up. So this is actually a bridge going over the other road and you can see how the vehicle is navigating through the environment, building a map of the environment. And while the vehicle is driving through the environment, of course, we are um, building up this post graph on the fly. This is kind of some of the coordinate systems that you see here. And now when the system will re-enter the known part of the environment at some point in time, the loop closure system will kick in, find a loop closure, and then um, can correct for drift that was accumulated on the way so that we get a consistent um, map representation of the environment. And we can also do this for uh, other data sets or other parts of the um, Kitty sequence, uh, Kitty data set. So what you see, for example, here are the different sequences from the Kitty data set and the system running, building um, consistent maps of the environment. Again, using the surfal ideas or surfals, registering with respect to the existing model um, through this projective fashion, um, having a loop closer system in place and running post graph optimization in order to build a consistent model of the environment. And with this approach, with this SUMA system is able to build consistent maps of the environment. Okay, so this was the geometry part. What about semantics? What can we do in order to estimate the semantics about the scene? And we
we have been investing uh, quite a bit of time in building fast semantic segmentation approaches for camera images. This was work done by Andres Miliotto from my lab and he released the Bonnet and now the newer Bonnetal um, pipeline which is basically an implementation of existing um, CNN architectures but really tailored towards speed so that we can efficiently perform a high quality semantic segmentation at 50 to 70 frames per second and turn this camera image what we see here in this semantic information estimating which pixel belongs to which semantic class. And one of the work um, that we've been doing in the lab where Andres also took a lead in here was using this also for LiDAR data. So the key question is can we perform the same thing providing uh, a point-wise labeling of the 3D LiDAR scan so that we can take the raw 3D LiDAR scan where here the color is just the distance from the object from the projection center of the scanner into a semantically segmented point cloud where color information um, refers to a semantic class. And how can we do this ideally exploiting the existing CNN architectures? So what we can do is instead of using the full 3D information because it's quite difficult to feed it into the um, such a CNN, we can turn the 3D point cloud into a range image because in the end the scanners also produce an image. So the scanner is rotating with, in this example, for example, 64 LiDAR beams and the scanner is rotating and taking those scans. So we can see this actually as a single column in an image. And so basically a range image is a collection of those scan lines arranged in an image which has then not the um, central projection as you would use it for, for a camera, but you basically can project it on a cylinder. And in this way you can unroll the cylinder and then you get one of those range images. And this again is in a 2D data structure where in every pixel the distance information to the obstacle or the measured range is stored. And the question is can we actually use this 2D representation and then turn it into a semantically annotated range image. So if we can get estimate the semantic information based on this range image, we can then project this information back into the 3D scene and then obtain the um, semantically segmented 3D point cloud. So instead of doing this directly, we can actually go through the range image representation, perform the semantic segmentation in the range image, where we can exploit the idea of images and then project it back into the 3D scene. What we need in order to do this, beside this CNN which sits here and does the work, we need to train these systems. So we need to have a system which allows us to train how semantic objects look like in this range image representation. And for that, um, the team from my lab, together with the labs of Jürgen Gall and Sven Binke, also both from the University of Bonn, we set up Semantic Kitty, which is um, basically providing annotations for every single LiDAR endpoint within the Kitty dataset. So as a result of this, we selected, we manually labeled training data by labeling every single endpoint um, in a manual labeling procedure uh, of every single range scan that has been recorded in the Kitty dataset. So this is substantial labeling effort which takes more than a person year if you want to do this, but if you have that at hand, you can exploit this semantic information for the, um, for the range images in order to um, train your classifier so that this data, what you see here, which is training data, that you get similar good estimates for, um, for estimating that from data and kind of Another uh, short example, a video sequence, what you see here is a car driving around. What I really like to see, you can actually see the kids here on the swing as the red object going forth and back because really every scan is manually annotated saying which semantic class this pixel belongs to. And the approach we have been developed was the work done by um, Andres, Jens, um, Belay as well and a few other people from my lab where we tried to exploit the semantic segmentation architecture and see what we can do in order to improve the semantic segmentations for the, um, when we are working with this uh, range image data. So we have this approach, we are working with this range image, feed in the range image into our CNN architecture and this is basically heavily inspired from the QuizSec architecture um, with a small number of modifications but not too many um, where we can turn our range image into a semantically segmented range image. The problem that we have if we do this in reality is often that the boundaries 
of objects are not very well segmented. So this is an example that you can see here. So this is a range image and you can see uh, a few objects like the car over here. And then you can actually see that although pixels which are very nearby or look nearby in the range image are actually further away because basically a, a little bit, a part of the car is projected onto the wall behind the car. You see also similar things if you have uh, a tree trunk over here, that some of the tree pixels are projected onto the vegetation lying behind that tree. And this is a problem that you basically have these, these objects in the 2D range image bleeding into the environment, into objects which are um, behind the actual object. And there, this is one of the reasons is because you're downsampling in the CNN architecture and in this downsampling you actually lead to mistakes. So what we have been doing is trying to clean up those labels which basically works with a CNN-based uh, or K-nearest neighbor voting, not CNN, sorry, K-nearest neighbor voting um, in the 3D space, taking the depth information into account that we can actually fix this information. So if you look here to the um, semantic segmentation approach for LiDAR scans, and this is kind of the standard output that uh, the CNN architecture generates, you can see it here on the walls, you can see a lot of shadows of those cars, which are not very well represented. And so the question is how can this cleaning of the labels actually help us to do a better job. And I want to draw your attention to those circles over here and then we can actually turn the sweep over it and fix the mistakes that we have seen in those circles. And as a result from that um, the approach will generate smooth trajectories or smooth labels that you can see all the or most of these boundary effects of the of the semantic segmentation bleeding into the environment uh, actually goes away because we get consistent um, semantic labels estimated from the LiDAR data so that we can take just the LiDAR scan and nothing else into account in order to come up with this representation. Okay the next question is how we can how can we exploit the geometric information and the semantic information inside the SLAM system. So what I've done so far, I told you how our geometric SLAM system works, but we haven't talked about how the semantics are integrated into the SLAM system. So what we in the end want to have is actually a map which encodes the geometry of the scene as well as the semantic information of the scene. So if we move in, for example, in this local region, we want to have a representation that looks like this, so that for every local pixel or every surface element, we actually have not only the geometrically correct pose, we also have the semantic information available. And this is an approach which is an extension of SUMA, which also has been um, published last year, combining the ideas of SUMA and the circles with the semantic information that we are estimating. So again, we have our input point cloud, uh, our raw point cloud. We perform a semantic segmentation very similar to what we have done before with this squeeze based architecture. Based on some efficiency reason how that could be integrated to the pipeline, it, it's not using the um, K-nearest neighbor approach it basically performs a depth-aware flood fill algorithm um, to filter out some of the noise, but it is from the result very similar to the um, K-nearest neighbor voting, uh, taking into account depth information. The only advantage was here it was easier to integrate in the sensor RT framework where this system has been implemented. So we are basically getting a corrected um, depth image and then two things happening. The first thing is we can use the semantic information for filtering dynamics in an easier or more robust way than uh, compared to the fact when we would ignore the semantic information. And we can use the semantic information for the scan alignment if we compute this, um, semant consider the semantic information into this projective ICP approach. So again, the first step is basically a depth aware a multi class flood fill, which um, kind of eliminate some small artifacts that we have in the semantic annotation similar to the k-nearest neighbor voting approach. And the next thing which is important is the filtering of dynamics. So because we want to get rid of information that belongs to dynamic objects. So we can see here as an example, so these are uh, the traces of a car moving through the environment and ideally we want to actually filter that out so that this information is not in our scans anymore. It's however not that easy that you can just say let's remove all car pixels in our, in our environment. You actually can do this but this can also lead to suboptimal estimation behaviors. What we actually want to do, we want to only remove those objects which are actually moving. So if this is the original scan, you can see for example here the car coming um, from the front but you see also a lot of parked cars in this, um, nearby. And what we would like to do, we want to remove these, those 
car pixels over here, but we want to keep the car parking cars in the object because it actually helps us for the registration, because it provides good 3D structure that the scanner can use for the incremental pose estimation. So instead of removing everything which is movable, like all the cars, which would all vanish over here, we are actually able to remove the car, which, is, which is, was over here, so um, coming the opposite direction, but keep the parking cars by taking the semantic information into account, grouping them and see which of those parts are actually moving and which are static, so that this information can be used to filter out dynamic objects, not all dynamic objects will be done, but a uh, couple of them. And then we can take the semantic information also into account when performing the scan registration by basically computing a mask of what we are seeing and what is in our map. And those things which are inconsistent can be masked out if they are associated to typical dynamic objects. And this also allows us to get rid of some of the mistakes, reduce the weight in here so that we are able to register the uh, or use the semantic information within the registration process. What you see here is a top-down view of a car navigating through the scene. This is now this circle-based representation um, where the color of the circle uh, is the semantic information. And it's not just the semantic information from the current scan, but the um, circle basically um, represents um, or uses a probability distribution over the, the circle and so can also update the belief and if a circle then has been let's say initially seen as um, let's say a car and then it's been seen multiple times as a different object then the different object uh, for example a road will actually um, dominate the estimation procedure similar to how that happens in occupancy grip mapping for example. And we can also show that this actually gives us a competitive advantage for the scan uh, matching algorithm, especially in challenging situations. So what you see here is um, probably the most tricky part of the Kitty data set. It's a scene where the car drives over a highway towards a traffic jam and all cars move basically at the same speed or a similar speed than the vehicle. Um, and as a result of this, there's very little 3D structure the system can rely on. And if we just do a geometric slime approach on this, we can see that um, there's actually a large deviation between the um, actual estimate and uh, the, the ground truth and the actually estimated trajectory. And compared to that, if you use the semantic information, take that into account, we can then better estimate which cars are moving, not use them in the registration process, and in this way improve the estimate. I just kind of rerun that video um, so that you can actually better see that. Okay, here we go. Uh, so you see the um, ground truth estimate, uh, the ground truth, and the the estimated car, as well as an hour setup where they're basically overlapping. And what you can also see is in this parts over here, these are the traffic signs um, illustrated that are smeared out, um, where the traffic sign here keeps the position. And so you can see on a few static objects, we as humans are able to identify if this is a consistent map or not. And this information can be exploited in the semantic slam approach so that the semantic information actually helps the geometric information. That's not always needed, so geometry itself works pretty good, but there are a few situations which lead to failure cases, such as this one over here, when a lot of cars are moving similarly to our vehicle itself, where this in semantic information can make a difference. The next ingredient that SLAM systems typically have is a loop closing system. Loop closing means we want to identify when, if we are at the same place, yes or no. And so if you have, for example, two 3D range scan, like here, top views of range scan, the question is, is this the same place? Is this a loop closure? And um, most of the systems, like also our SUMA system, basically takes initial estimates that it has and then tries to project the um, model into the current position. So how would an observation look like if our estimate would be right? And then tries to make an alignment between what the system sees and what the projected scan looks like. And if it is successful for a sequential number of steps, let's say, or consecutive number of scans, then this loop closure is accepted. Um, we can however also go for a different approach. And one approach that we have developed here by PhD student Raini Chen from my lab is a so-called overlap-based approach. So overlap is a concept that is used in photogrammetry for computing the overlap between images and we kind of generalize that to range images and to 3D scans. And it's basically how, which fraction of the image or then range image overlaps between two images. And we can actually use a learning approach in order to learn if two 3D input scans encoded as a range image have an overlap, yes or no, without using any pose information, at least in the, when we apply our, our um, 
our CNN. For training, of course, we need this information, but generating this training data is fairly easy to do if you have already a working SLAM system in place and maybe add some loop closures manually um, or fix wrong loop closures. Then you can use this data to actually train your model and try to find those overlaps. Um, so the system works in the following. This is an overlap. It's called OverlapNet, uh, published at RSS this year. So you have two range scans. You use um, the, the range image, you use some normal information you can extract from the range image, laser intensities, and this semantic information, and feed this. Um, this is kind of a pre-processing step, and then feed that into um, uh, CNN. And this architecture com, uh, consists of two legs which have shared weights, one taking the first scan, the other one taking the second scan um, into account. Um, and then there is our two outputs. One is a so-called delta hat, which estimates the overlap between those two scans. And in addition to this delta hat, we can also estimate the yaw angle offset using a correlation hat and in this case, um, estimate just the yaw angle, so not the, not the attitude, not the pitch and the roll, just um, the, the yaw angle, but this is in the autonomous driving domain, probably the most relevant orientation angle. And then use this information, for example, as an initial guess um, of a loop closure estimate and verify it using a scan matching approach. And this overlap net um, worked very successfully. Um, of course, has to be trained, but you can also show that you can train in one environment, transfer it to another environment, and find good loop closure points. So a few examples over here, the blue dot over here in this precision recall curve um, is the original system used in Zuma. So you actually want to be as close as possible here in that corner. And then you have the different approaches that you can take. So the green plot here is, is our approach, not using any geometric information. But if you additionally use the geometric information that comes from your post graph um, in order to reject wrong loop closures or reject loop closures which are, let's say, outside the three sigma bound, then you can actually push it even further to this red plot um, being better than the original SUMA loop closing and also alternative loop closing methods which are um, popularly used. So this learning-based approach is able for pairs of range scans tell you if this is a potential loop closure, yes or no, and then you can use it as an initial guess for your subsequent ICP or loop closure algorithm that you already have verify those loop closures and in this way come up with a fairly robust system to find those loop closures even in very challenging environments. Um, with this I'm coming to the end of my talk about the core SLAM system that we have been developed using semantic information and geometric information and I want to use the last minutes to give you a short outlook. This is work which will be um, published very soon at IROS 2020 uh, this fall. And this is, these are two works. One, a generalization to other data sets or other sensor setups. And the second one is a panoptic segmentation system. Um, so if you remember, we had the semantic segmentation system over here going from our initial scan to, uh, from our raw scan to our semantically segmented scan through this range image. The problem when you have this approach, which is attractive because you can use the CNN architecture as used from computer vision directly, is that the generation of these images depend on the configuration of your scanner. So if you use a different scanner or you use a different sensor setup of your scanner, um, this will lead to scans which look substantially different to the original range scan. And in this case, the performance of those system typically degrades. Um, this, the, the reason for this is that this is the, the way the scanner generates this image and where the scanner is mounted on a car has a substantial impact on what the scanner sees and this generalizes not very well to other scenes. There's a small example over here. So one data set recorded, uh, for, so this system was trained on Kitty. So this is a semantic segmentation on Kitty. And um, if you use the new scenes data set um, for, per, um, or use the new scenes data set and run the classifier trained on Kitty on new scenes, uh, we can actually see that the prediction gets worse compared to the ground truth. So you can see a lot of color mismatches between those scenes. That means we need to retrain our classifier so that it's able to run on new data sets without retraining from scratch. And what we have done is building a system for domain transfer, which uses a combination of a SLAM system, then simulating data with a different sensor configuration from that SLAM system, combine this with a gun-based um, approach in order to perform a label transfer and transfer our classifiers to new domains so that we are able to transfer a system trained with one scanner also if our sensor setup on our car changes, which we believe is a very important step. 
And the last outlook I want to give is to a panoptic segmentation approach, which is a unified perception system providing you with the semantic segmentation on the one hand side and the instant segmentation on the other side. So how most state-of-the-art systems do that today, they take their um, sensor input, their LIDARs, um, and then they have one neural network which performs an object detection approach, gives you the instance information, and an independent neural network which provides you the semantic segmentation, and then try to fuse this information into a semantic um, instance segmentation. This has several problems. The first thing is you have to do quite some redundant computations because you need to run those um, those systems here in parallel, those neural networks. Um, but the second problem is that there is not necessarily a very good output coherence between those uh, semantic information and the instance segmentation because these are basically two different pipelines which are run. And we have been trying here to fuse this into a single pipeline um, with one encoder and two different decoders, an instant decoder and a semantic decoder, which allows you to do this in a joint estimation. And so with this network architecture, you are then able to estimate on the one hand side all the instances, for example, the cars, the pedestrian, the cyclists, so the things you see together with these stuff classes, or here showing both things and stuff together. So what is vegetation? What is road surface? And based on the single scan, get a consistent estimate of the of a semantic segmentation as well as the instance segmentation, which is then a valuable input for your autonomous driving um, domain. So, and this brings me to the end of my talk today, where I have shown you that maps do not necessarily store only geometric information, as it was done um, for quite a while. Of course, we have semantic information, but we can also estimate that semantic information online and integrate it in our mapping system. We looked here um, exclusively into LIDAR-based data, so using 3D LIDAR scans in order to perform this estimation and trying to fuse this in a semantic geometric estimation approach. I also gave you two outlooks on how to generalize this data and how an optic segmentation system could look like that we will release at IROS this year. So I thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank my collaborators, Andres Milioto, Jens Belay, Rainer Chen, uh, Ferdinand Langer, Ignacio Visso, Emanuel Palazzolo, Chris McCool, and Philippe Giger um, for their contributions to this work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>